Hello everybody, thank you to Josie and the team for inviting me and it's a really, really great venue to speak in so I'm very excited to be here today. Um, so I'm Marika Guy and I'm from Open Knowledge. Um, just to say my slides, a longer version, because I had a much longer version, are available on a service called um, SlideShare and they're under a Creative Commons licence so you're quite welcome to go and use those afterwards and see some of the other examples that I've got today to share with you. A little bit of background to me, um, just to say I work on a couple of projects, um, one of them, they're listed here, one of them is around open access, Pasteur for open uh, access there, Linked Up which is around education data and eSpace which is a really interesting project around getting people to use stuff in the cultural heritage sector, so stuff from museums and libraries in sort of innovative ways and trying to make money out of the open content, so they're mm -hmm. projects I work on, I have to mention those. Um, I'm also coordinator of the Open Education Working Group, uh, which I'll tell you more about in a minute. But just a little bit more about me as well. Um, I'm a mum of three, so I know the education sector from the other side. Um, I have uh, children at primary school and at secondary school, so I'm very interested in, obviously, their well-being and, and what happens in schools. But I'm also um, a lifelong learner, so I'm interested in learning. I learn online. I do these things sometimes called MOOCs. Um, so I'm coming at this from lots of different angles. But I just want to share with you my enthusiasm for open education and, and sort of a new way of thinking about education that it brings. Um, I have to say a little bit about open knowledge where I work. Um, I won't go into details. It's a, it's a quite confusing organisation. But what we do is that we promote um, open knowledge in a digital age. So we're really all about getting people to open knowledge and content and data up and make it um, useful, make it usable um, and I can talk more with people if they're interested in how we do that um, but I'll save that for in the coffee sessions if you like later on. So open education, I wanted to start off by saying that it's a really welcoming and accessible community. Um, anybody can be an open practitioner, um, you know it involves people from all around the world and we're really keen to see as many people involved in the community as possible so we welcome you with open arms. Um, just to point out, I have a, I'm using a Flickr image here and I have attributed at the bottom there. So as you can see, this is one way you can integrate fantastic resources into your, in your pre um, presenting and teaching. Um, your background is a traditional education background um, and you guys know this much more than I do, that there is a lot more to learning and teaching than just standing up there and talking. Okay? There's all sorts of aspects um, through different types of learning, through the process of teaching and how you involve your students, assessment um, and accreditation and lots of activities around there, the policies that, that sort of frame the work that you do and the curriculum, the funding behind that, and administration and, and the elements behind administration as well. And all of these can be taken forward into open education. They can apply just as much. Um, and so, for example, here, I've got this thing called the open education pie. It may be a cheese. If you, if you pay to pursuit, you may refer to it in different ways. But there are all these different aspects that are part of open education. Um, so there's a lot of work going on around policy, pushing policy in different countries, from the government level, um, from international level as well. There's some of the exciting stuff that people are doing around open education resources, and Bjorn's already explained, he, explained how they work, and we're going to talk much more today about how you, you guys can, can work with open education resources. Accreditation, lots of ideas around things like open badges. How can you, mm -hmm. if you do stuff on the internet, how can you be rewarded for doing that? How can you show, how can you have your scout badge? How can you change the way we accredit things? Um, licensing, again, something we'll be hearing more about today. Um, exciting tools that can, can help you to work with your open content. Um, data, a whole different area um, that we can, we can talk about, uh, how the data that comes out of schools, and the learning and teaching practice, and that's one of the areas I'm really enthusiastic for, is how can we open up learning and teaching practice? How can we rethink the way we do things um, on an education level? So I'm involved in the Open Education Working Group, and um, this is a group, it's an online group, and we bring together people from lots of different areas of open education all around the world. So it's a global group um, and people just share with us the projects they're working on. And we have teachers, we have practitioners, we have people who are interested in the open space, we have um, students, we have people from all different sectors and they share their experiences about the various different facets of open education. And this has given us some really great insight into the way people are doing things around the world. Um, so we've published a series of posts, and I, I would welcome you to come and have a look at these, which is open education from different countries' perspectives, and there's some really great experiences and case studies there. 
Um, we've got them from all different places. We published one this week, earlier this week, on, from Italy, which was very much focused on schools and the type of activity that they're, going, they're doing there. Actually, in quite a lot of countries, open education is happening a lot more in the higher education sector. But in Italy, it's very much um, the policy and the work there is, is around schools. So um, I would welcome you to go and have a look at that in the different key stages that they've been doing some exciting stuff in. Um, so I wanted to sort of home in on a couple of things that maybe you could go away and look at after today. Um, there was a, a project recently which ran from 2011 to 2014 and it was looking at sort of policies for, uh, for the take-up of open education resources and sort of uh, trying to coordinate these and push for countries to have more policies. And they had a series of country reports and, and different activities that were going on in different countries. And, and as you can see here, they've actually shared a sort of global map of different resources around the world. And they also have some similar um, sort of uh, papers and documents that you can look at that are helping schools to bring in open education resources and use them in different ways. Um, so lots of great insights there as part of that project. There's another UK, there's a UK project which is run by the Open University, which is called the OER Research Hub, um, and that's looking at the impact of open education resources. And it looks at it on lots of different levels, so through um, schools and higher education, but also lifelong learning and just sort of informal learning. So people learning things through things like YouTube or, mm -hmm. you know, going on and um, looking at a, a wiki how guide or something to learn how to do something. Um, and they have some really interesting insights in the type of impact that this work is, is um, achieving. And they have, again, they have a map and different interesting case studies. So I'd really uh, recommend you have a look at that. On a more sort of practical level, I wanted to share a couple of case studies with you. Um, we do a lot of work with Open Knowledge Island, who are a sort of chapter of our, our organisation. And they recently had the situation that a new curriculum was brought into the um, sort of computing area. And they said, well, we don't have any resources. What are we going to do? And so they worked with the government and they used the, um, the Curriculum Assessment Council. They brought together a group of teachers and they ran what was called a book sprint which was basically writing um, a, an open textbook in a, a day or two. So the whole, all of these teachers got together and brainstormed all the important areas that, that would be useful and wrote this, uh, this great textbook, which they then released and is now, um, I think it's, it's pretty much embedded in the curriculum and they're going back and revisiting that over um, sort of the next couple of years to make sure that it's current and, and relevant to the students. Iceland is a really interesting case study. It's a very exciting country. I'm going on holiday there since I'm pretty excited about Iceland, but they, they have a really small community of people who speak uh, the Icelandic language. I think they only have actually um, three, 300,000 speakers of it in their country, 350,000 in the world. And that means that it's, it's quite a unique language and it's quite difficult to get, again, textbooks in this area. And the textbooks tend to be out of date, they tend to be primarily in English. And so, in a way to solve this problem, they brought together lots of teachers from around the country um, to, to share open resources and they created this hub the education plaza where people would share resources, translate resources and work together in kind of very constructive ways. Um, so, you know, it's showing what you can achieve in different countries. The Philippines have a slightly different problem. They have a situation where lots of children living on the streets, which is a, a very sad problem. Um, the UNICEF have released statistics, but they have like something like 300,000 children living on the streets uh, um, that they, they want to get educated in some way. So they have a, a volunteer program where they bring in people to, who use open education resources to teach these children in, in different ways. These are not necessarily teachers as such, but people who are empowered using the resources to help these children. Um, they also have a lot of home-educated children in the Philippines, children who learn in slightly different ways. So um, the Open Education Resources framework is supporting them. And again, they have their own hub there that they're, they're using to, to su support and to hold their resources. Um, another example, South Africa. Um, this is an organisation, I think C of Ulva means uh, opening up in um, one of their uh, the South African languages. They have 11 different languages there. And they, um, they have a, um, an organisation that's part funded by uh, the government, but also has commercial input from different places and brings in volunteers and working staff. And they have created uh, a load of really exciting resources in lots of different areas. I think it's very focused on maths, English and science. And these resources are 
um, sort of allow, people use those in different workshops and they, again they do similar things to the book sprint but also that they run uh, workshop sessions where they bring children in to, to build on these resources and pass feedback into the, the, the resources themselves so the, one great thing about open education resources is that it's a very, you can be a, it's a very iterative process things can be changed very quickly and new insights can be um, utilised very very quickly um, there are lots more case studies. I could share so many with you. That's just a few. But I wanted to highlight that this is happening on a, on a global level. People are doing really e e great ways of sort of breaking down barriers to education and, and bringing education to more people. Um, I think Bjorn has already touched on some of the benefits of open education. Um, but I think there are so many. These are sort of areas that we're looking at into more, you know, um, <laughs> hypotheses that we're trying to sort of find better evidence for. But we believe that, you know, things can, uh, open education resources can make a significant difference to performance um, through access. But also, um, some other examples here, retention, um, you know, resources being available online and for people to use can help people who are, who are sort of at risk and uh, have to maybe move away or use a different institution. The financial benefits are huge. Um, the support <coughs> benefits, the whole infrastructure of people working together, teachers and educators and people who write this content, people who are experts in the field working together. And these are really exciting benefits that we... Um, that we can, can see as part of um, open education resources. So I wanted to conclude with a, a kind of metaphor um, that came from this guy TJ Bliss from, um, from the F um, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. And he talks about the motivation for using open education resources. And um, he says it, he almost sees it like it's being a, a bit similar to the doctor in the gym. Mm. So he says that... Um, in, when a lot of people pushed into this situation by financial requirements, you know, we've got no money, we need to do this in a very financial way. So it's a bit like kind of when you're ill, you have to go to the doctor, you suddenly need to get there. But he says, but the real potential lies in the, the way that we change our thinking about learning and teaching practice. So the real potential is in the kind of thinking about it in advance, going to the gym, making yourself help, healthy and, and doing amazing new things with, your, with the way you work. Um, so sometimes the, the being pushed into it, the doctor situation, can lead into the gym situation. You know, I'm, 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 I'm feeling a bit better now. I've got through the financial situation. Now I can think about making things better. And he says that what we really need to do is to start recognising that people are using open education resources and they are part of the mainstream. And once we start doing that, then the, you know, the potential, all possibilities still exist with what we can really do and change in our, the way we work and teach as educators. Um, so I just thought that was a really interesting analogy there to share with you. Um, I'm happy to share any more of these insights or any more ideas around open education and how it can work in different ways. And um, I'm looking forward to the sessions later and, and talking to you about you know, the amazing stuff that's going to happen in your, your institutions.